now uh, we have uh, another speaker from this time from United Kingdom. Uh, I hope I expl uh, pronounce it your family name right. Uh, Geraldine Cambridge, is it or correct? Oh, yeah. Full point there. <laughs> okay, and you are from University College in London. Yes. And. Uh, uh, you have been working on apparently on B cells and the role of B cells in various conditions, including this one. And uh, now I think you are going to tell us about the role of antibodies against B cells. Uh, the B cells is uh, the cell that makes antibodies in the body, and uh, it is under control of T cells generally. Uh, actually, I was at uh, not at University College, but at. Um, uh, Institute of Medical Research in Mill Hill, when Mark Feldman started to work on antibodies uh -huh. against B cells. Uh, yes. At that okay? time, we didn't understand yes. that it was an important subject, but uh, now it, uh, I think he's a millionaire at least. He is at least a millionaire. And okay, I'm still yes. Waiting for some money from. And he's very mean too, so <laughs> he, we, we don't get any of his money. Okay then, uh, Geraldine, welcome to talk about the role of B cells and antibodies to B cells in in these conditions. Uh, I'm not quite going to talk about antibodies to B cell. My claim to fame is that um, it's nearly 20 years since we first used uh, rituximab in patients with autoimmunity at UCL. And it's nearly 10 years since uh, the Norwegians, Flug and Mella, used rituximab in the first few patients with uh, ME-CFS. I'm going to talk just a, a summary of some of the immunology of ME-CFS, what's known. Then I'm going to just summarize a bit about rituximab. And then I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing on B cells and B cell biology at UCL. Okay, I'm a professor of immunology at UCL, and I work mostly on, on rheumatology, rheumatological diseases. But in the last few years, I've developed a very strong interest in MECFS. Um, this paper we've just published is a review of the immunological changes that have been described uh, in MECFS. We've just published this year. And so if anyone's interested, I can give you a copy. Okay, I think we're here, finally. Um, a lot of my colleagues still don't believe that ME-CFS is an organic illness, but uh, it is. So I think we're finally here. Um, the etiology and pathogenesis, as Maureen just explained, involves metabolic dysfunction, but also the immune system seems to be strongly involved. And I think most of you would report that you had a virus infection or a vaccination which triggered off the disease. That's our experience in the UK too. Um, the pathogenesis is character characterized by post-exertional malaise, as you know. Um, but the mechanism must involve the interference in recovery from the response to stresses because the level of activity is sort of fairly normal. It's when you try and do it again that things go wrong. So this suggests that the, the pathways that are activated when you increase uh, demand, they don't reset properly. I think we'd all agree with that. So we've also got to invoke chronicity in this, like all, well, most autoimmune diseases. Um, there must be some kind of feedback pathway perpetuating the disease. And I think the immune system is involved. Okay, just to sort of remind you about the complexity of what happens when you get a virus infection and how many things can go wrong. When you first get a, a virus, for example, in the gut or the lungs or whatever, you get an early sort of innate danger signal response where you get a lot of mediators activated. This then sets off a cascade where um, the cells and, and uh, mediators communicate with one another and, and uh, recruit appropriate responses. And then you get the acquired immune system where you get effectors like antibodies or T cells to control, to go back and control the infection itself. So you can see that there are many, many places where things can go wrong in the immune system. Um, one of the main areas of research has been looking at um, these some of these innate mechanisms, such as natural killer cells. They're one of the first things activated after a virus. And there are many, many papers showing that there are changes in numbers or that they're not functioning properly. Um, but again, there's no real consensus, but I think most people feel that there is something, you know, not quite right in the, uh, in the natural killer cells. And there's some work in Sweden suggesting that 
the changes in function may be due to a soluble factor. Um, cytokines, the second part is this communication between cells, and the main thing that communicates between the immune cells and, and uh, other effector cell systems um, are these things called cytokines, and they also communicate between the immune system and the nervous system. And looking at these profiles, we can see where they're coming from and what they're likely to do. So again, these have been looked at. Again, there's fairly, uh, there's fairly inconsistent results, but there's getting to be more consensus by using very specially selected groups, using proper control groups that are that are more easy and more appropriate to compare. So there is some potential for these being useful to create a sort of a, a, an immune or a signature which will be is absolutely essential for uh, stratifying patient groups because you know how wide the spectrum is. Um, what about B cells? Well, again, there's considerable um, dissent over whether the B cells themselves um, are changed in number or type or um, function. Um, again, there's not much consensus, but overall, I would say, looking at the data, there's not that much difference looking at B cells as a whole, um, except the B cell associations are stronger. The vaccination viral infection aspect, um, particularly by the B cell virus, Epstein-Barr virus, is common to many patients. There are lots of these receptors for um, neurotransmitters on B cells, and there is an increased uh, instance of some kinds of B cell lymphomas later in life. Um, but in summary, uh, there is some consistency in the, um, the sorts of cytokines that seem to be wrong. A lot of them are involved in um, communication between B cells and T cells. There does seem to be something, even if a, a mild dysfunction of natural killer cells. T cells seem to be fairly normal in most of the papers. B cells, well, the main reason why B cells have hit the news in uh, MECFS, of course, is because of rituximab. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about rituximab just to explain some of our experiences with it and um, uh, what Flug and Miller have shown in, in their studies so far. And of course, we're waiting within the next few weeks. They're going to decode the, um, the double-blind st uh, study of the 160 patients in, in Norway in the uh, placebo-controlled trial. So basically, looking at all the data they have published, rituximab does seem to work. Um, they've performed three separate studies. Uh, Rituximab is a monoclonal antibody that kills B cells, basically. It kills all the B cells in the blood. And the way it's administered is by intravenous um, infusion. You get a gram um, delivered very slowly, uh, together with other drugs. It takes, it takes about seven or eight hours, actually. So you have to sit there while it's being infused. And then you have a further infusion one or two weeks later. This is the protocol we use for our patients with rheumatoid. Um, and then we do a blood test at one month to make sure the B cells have been removed properly. Okay, and the B cells that are removed are all the ones expressing this molecule CD20. Now, B cells are coming out every day from your bone marrow. So 10 to the 9 every single day coming out. Um, rituximab doesn't kill these early ones here. So they're not killed. And the ones that are making the antibodies, the plasma cells, the long-lived ones, they're not killed either. It just kills these ones here that are circulating. And it kills them very quickly. They're, they're killed by your own body cells. When the B cells get coated with the, the rituximab, all your killer cells come in and and destroy the, the coated B cells. Um, but it kills those B cells in lymph nodes and spleen, etc., and it kills those B cells at different rates in different patients. The other thing about rituximab is that it hangs around in your bone marrow for quite a long time, for months, and it therefore stops. This is where it, it's actually how it works. It actually stops 
all the new B cells from coming out of your bone marrow, usually for about six months. This doesn't affect your, your immunity to viruses or bacteria because most of that immunity is, resides in your plasma cells, the long-lived plasma cells. I'm just going to summarize some of the data of Flug and Mellor just to sort of refresh your memories. Um, they did a small um, double-blind placebo-controlled study with 15 patients treated with rituximab, 15 placebo, and they found a major response uh, in nine of the patients. I mean, this is about the kind of rate you see in rheumatoid arthritis patients, so it's pretty good. And the duration of the response varied hugely between two months and, and about six months or longer. Now, this slide's interesting. You don't have to worry about any details, but these are individual patients, and then the different colored lines, the different sorts of symptoms, like fatigue, um, cognitive impairment, pain. And the interesting thing is that they all seem to, most, in most patients, they seem to, to um, uh, improve or get worse at the, at, together, which is quite... I mean, I was quite struck by this because you don't see this so much in autoimmunity. Then they tried another study where they, they gave rituximab every three months, a maintenance treatment for up to 15 months, and they found that this was the aim to see whether they could get a longer response by prolonging the time that the B cells were not circulating around. Um, and they did seem to prolong the response. While the B cells were gone, the patient seemed to be well. Uh, and there's the ongoing phase three um, study go at the moment. So we're waiting in a few weeks or actually a few months, we should know. Okay, so from our experience in autoimmunity, rituximab works best in diseases where there are autoantibodies um, associated with the disease. For example, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, the autoantibodies are, are pathogenic. They actually cause the, the damage to the, the organs. And these are the sorts of diseases where um, rituximab works best. These other diseases down here, these sorts of different kinds of arthritis type syndromes, which don't have any autoantibodies associated, show no response to rituximab. So really, it does seem to hit the diseases where autoantibodies are involved. Um, and from our um, studies in autoimmunity, again, you get clinical responses can vary hugely between patients and in different diseases. Um, it can take quite a long time, it can take months. So patients will sort of say, look, I've had rituximab two months ago, I'm still feeling awful. Um, but then three months, I say, oh, I'm feeling better now. Some patients, four months, it, it can vary hugely. And it seems to depend on how quickly certain of the bad autoantibodies are removed. ME-CFS, it probably takes back actually about three to eight months post rituximab to work. So it seems, it, it is delayed. It's not, you know, you're not going to sort of feel better tomorrow if you're going to feel better at all. Okay, so it takes months of response and it suggests that there's a, a soluble factor perhaps or some kind of interaction of B cells with some other kind of cell um, that's gradually reduced after killing the B cells. So why may it work? Well, we know that rituximab stops the B cells turning into memory cells and plasma cells. And these plasma cells will make antibodies, and they may be making antibodies to key molecules that will know many different um, possibilities there. But they also can stop interactions of the B cells with other T cells, uh, other cells such as T cells, which make cytokines, or in other kind of more complicated ways. Now, I'm just going to show you a little bit of data just to sort of give you a feel for what's happened. Each little dot here is a B cell, okay? So this is before rituximab. We can divide the B cells into different types. These sort of naive, these are new ones coming out of the bone marrow. Then they gradually mature around here to memory cells. So this is happening all the time. When you get rid of the B cells with the rituximab, this is a few months after, you can see that they're all gone. When they come back again, it's just like being a baby again. The, uh, the B cells coming back are naive, they're, they're new B cells, and they gradually mature. But the interesting thing, again, from other um, autoimmune diseases is that the number of B cells coming back here doesn't predict whether you're going to relapse here or get worse here at all. 
it's actually it's the sort of quality of the B cells, not the quantity of the B cells that's important. I'm just going to show a graph. You don't have to worry about the details. Just concentrate here. This is a patient treated with rituximab. And then the blue line is um, the, the disease activity. So the poor clinical functions down the bottom, feeling better is up here. So after rituximab, they feel better here. Then they get worse again. Now, if you look at this black, there's no B cells in the blood here. But this black line tells you about how the B cells are maturing. I remember I said that um, you get rid of all the B cells, stop the B cells coming out, and then when the B cells come back, the naive ones start to mature again. So here, this black line underneath here, this means that there's no maturing of B cells. When it goes up here, it means the B cells are actually turning into memory cells. And you can see this sort of seems to correlate with clinical function going down. So these are the sort of things we need to look at when we're looking at the data from these studies. Okay, so are there any types of B cells that trigger relapse? Well, sometimes the ones that come out of the bone marrow freshly do trigger relapse. Sometimes it takes months. Some patients with rheumatoid take years after the B cells come back to relapse. So they need time to mature and restart the cycle. We don't know much about MECFS yet. So how could they be involved? Well, we've been looking at this now for the past couple of years, and the first things we did was to say, well, if the B cells are causing some of disease in some of the patients anyway, at least, um, are they different from healthy controls? So, are any, and also, are there any changes in their, their function, their metabolic function, which could change the way they make antibodies or interact with other cells? Um, and also, the change in the B cells are mirroring what's happening in the other, other tissues, such as in the gut or the nervous system. So you can get quite a lot of information because the B cells are such a dynamic population. So I won't go into details, obviously, but what we, start, what we did was looked, we collected a cohort of patients and looked at the types of B cells in the blood. Um, using fairly standard techniques. And that's looking for the ones, the early ones that come out of the bone marrow right through to the plasma path. So we just lo looked and compared with, the, uh, with an age match controls. And again, these dots are all just one B cell. These are two different ways of splitting them up into young and old B cells. Okay, so when we look at these, so, and by looking at in this way, we can tell whether there's something wrong with the early B cells, or these cells here, and whether they're prone to be making autoantibodies. Okay, so what did we find? We found absolutely no difference in the B-cell subsets compared with the healthy controls. All of these subsets that we looked at were all exactly the same proportion, and they had the same percentage, or same numbers of receptors of each of the things we looked at per cell. But then we looked a bit deeper into... Um, more sophisticated markers on these B cells that may have something to do with energy metabolism. Oops. And we found two significant differences between the B cells in patients and controls. Again, I won't go into details, but these, there's just a thing called CD24. So this expression of this molecule was much higher in the patients. And then these cells here were also, there was a higher proportion of those, and they're involved with responses to Epstein-Barr virus. Just a little tiny bit about these cells. This, again, is published in Clinex Women All last year. And we found that the percentage of these so-called CD24 B cells and the numbers of receptors were higher in the patients, significantly higher. This is really quite, quite a marked difference in, in these patients. Um, so what does this molecule do, this CD24? Well, it's, it's very important in, in B cell maturation. I've just got another couple of slides on that. And these other cells, these so-called marginal zone B cells, um, are important in responses to EBV. Uh, so what does this CD24 molecule do? Well, this, what we've looked at, what the, my PhD student, Fain, has shown is it's linked with one of a very, very important energy producing pathway, which involves phosphorylation of this molecule here. Um, so it may be linked 
with the way that the B cells increase their energy supply when they're stimulated. And if this goes wrong, they may go down the wrong path and make the wrong antibodies. Um, so that's what, it's this main molecule is called ATP. So it senses this, this, this uh, AMPK, senses low levels of um, ATP and stress, and then you normally get phosphorylation of this molecule. And so it's a really main controller of replenishing, replenishing, which I think is a key word, cellular um, energy supplies. But we don't know whether this is actually functional. I mean, we can see that there, that seems to be increased expression, but we don't know whether it's functional, and that's what we're looking at now. So just to conclude that bit, um, so the increased expression of this CD24 we found may reflect some kind of phosphorylation in response to stress or in low energy levels. And then the other cells, um, this is, rings these, these um, memory cells here that were also increased in the patients. And also, they tended to be highest in the patients with the, the shortest history of disease. Um, as I said, these are very important in the early response to Epstein-Barr virus. And they also have a, a different sort of route of stimulation. In fact, this route of stimulation is, is characterized by B cells that go through the gut. So the differences we've found so far seem to be in the same sort of population of B cells, these marginal zone B cells. And these are associated with the earliest responses to virus, particularly to EBV. And the earliest response to EBV really is key in telling what's going to happen um, later in the, the evolution of the virus and the interaction between the virus and the immune system in the human. Okay, so um, the other thing that we found was some differences in antibody levels to EBV, um, these IgM antibodies, again going with this marginal zone um, abnormality. Um, and also we found that um, this may reflect a different pathway for these B cells to go down. Instead of going this way, they're just going sort of straight here. So we're just working on that now. Um, so we think that maybe these differences in the marginal zone B cells may actually reflect changes in energy requirements of the B cells after stimulation. But what's causing this, we don't know. Um, but we do know that B cells are a very dynamic population. They use different metabolic pathways as they mature. So they're a very sensitive indicator, very useful to study metabolism. Um, and just, I'm just going to finish with a final slide. Um, the other interesting thing about B cells is that the type of stimulus to the B cell through the gut or through a virus um, is dependent on different energy pathways. And we've shown that, for example, you don't have to know the difference here, this, this is T-dependent versus T-independent stimulation. You can see that these, there's differences between the two. This is the size of mitochondria after stimulation. So they're different. And then also, this is proliferation, so how many divisions you can make. There are differences um, in terms of how the B cells, different B cells respond to different stimuli. So it gives another sort of layer to look at the responses. And then the other thing we're doing is looking at, um, as Maureen was saying, the metabolism, metabolomics, looking at the uh, metabolites produced um, after various uh, different stimuli. And again, we've got this T-independent, T-dependent. Again, you don't have to worry about it. Um, you can see that there are differences in what is produced if, when you stimulate B cells in different ways. So this gives us another handle on what's going on. So we're finding differences in the way you stimulate B cells, what happens. Um, we've looked at normal individuals. We've done a few studies now with MECFS patients. I just want you to see, compare the coloured ones with the grey bars here. And this is MECFS patients compared to normal controls. Again, this is this mitochondrial size. And you can see that there are clear differences between the mitochondria in the B cells from the patients in the controls. So we're just extending um, 
so there, there may be a, a dysregulation in some of the B cell responses. Um, whether this is acquired or it's an uncovered genetic alteration, which has happened because of infection, or because the balance between this sort of early and later T-dependent response is disturbed. Um, also, a different type of auto uh, antibody, including autoantibodies, which have been described. But I think we're sort of getting somewhere. So we're extending all these functional studies on stratified uh, populations, we hope, using our in vitro techniques. And also we're collaborating with the Norwegians um, because our expertise is B cell phenotypes, obviously. So um, we're collaborating with them and we really look forward to, to getting our hands on that data. So thank you very much to RME. It's, I've had a wonderful time in Sweden and uh, this is my team, I, Fain, and me. And this is Christopher Armstrong from Australia who does the metabolomics. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Geraldine, for this uh, interesting lecture. Uh, we'll have some, uh, we have time for some short discussion now after the lecture before coffee. And may I start by, uh, we heard in the first lecture that uh, there is an increase of lipopolysaccharide in, uh, in these patients, and I suppose it is then from uh, E. coli then, since it's the most gram, important gram-negative bacteria of the gut flora. The lipopolysaccharides, as well as Epstein biovirus, they are potent uh, polyclonal activators of B cells. I didn't uh, hear that this too was taken into account here. It's it's nice, a... yeah. In humans, um, LPS doesn't directly activate the B cells, but we haven't found increased LPS binding protein in our patients. But we're probably maybe looking at different cohort. And we certainly haven't found, we found increased IgG levels in MECFS patients, but we found no evidence of uh, increased division or anything in the, in the circulating B cells, just in those mm -hmm. phenotypes. But, uh, I mean, EBV is a known B cell activator. Oh, yes. Yeah. And uh, a feature of acute EBV infection is uh, generation of autoantibodies, isn't it? A lot of autoantibodies. Yeah, and uh, rheumatoid I, 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 yeah. I'm amazed that that... that Concept is not taken into discussion in this. Uh, uh, there, uh, there should be um, Carmen um, Scheiben, Carmen in Berlin has shown autoantibodies to um, neuroendocrine receptors, mm -hmm. which I'm really looking forward to getting our patient samples tested because I think they may be extremely important. We have looked for things like DNA antibodies, rheumatoid factors. We haven't found any in our patient cohorts, but there's certainly antithyroid antibodies, but then normal population have got thyroid antibodies. I think it's going to be these neurotransmitter antibodies may be important, which may be okay. good. <laughs> so, uh, yes, well, any new, well, any new uh, uh, questions for any new people, no? Oh, a question then, a short question. <clears throat> Lars Berman again, about bacteria this time bacteria. again. Uh, thank you for your interesting talk. There is one uh, other aspect of, of B cells, and that is the possibility of making autoantibodies. Yes. As I said before, all our basic metabolisms are, come from bacteria. The, the one called metabolism, the Krebs cycle, the glycolysis, mm -hmm. and there is evidence that patients have antibodies against their own uh, enzymes in these Power metabolisms. Yeah. So when you get but a bacterial infection, you, there is a possibility to get antibodies against all these uh, metab uh, all the enzymes in all these energy metabolisms. And by molecular, mo so-called molecular, molecular mimicry, <laughs> mm. uh, these antibodies directed against bacteria can by mistake attack the patient's mm. own metabolic enzymes. And there is evidence that this is happening in the ME patients. Do you have some comments on that? Yeah, the evidence is not strong. Um, there are anti autoantibodies, of course, to, you know, to things like pyruvate dehydrogenase, 
and other, mito and some other mitochondrial enzymes, succinate dehydrogenase as well. But uh, the, the cell-penetrating autoantibodies, they, I mean, and autoantibodies can get into cells by various interesting ways, but there's not any firm data on that in MECFS. Um, but there hasn't been that much done on it. And they'd be mostly IgM if they cross track with bacteria, which is fine. But um, we haven't found them okay. yet. So are you... Sorry. Speak in, your, in the microphone, please, loudly. Hello. I'd like to ask, how often do you experience patients... Your name, please. My name is Lotta Lindström. From... I'm from Stockholm. I'm a doctor and also patient and also have a severe uh, ill child with MECFS. Uh, I wonder how often you experience patients to get worse on uh, uh, Maptera, Rituximab, and, and what you think the background is of patients getting worse on this treatment. Okay, number one, I'm not a clinician, but I do work very closely with the clinicians in autoimmune disease. Uh, Maureen brought up the subject, several patients have got worse on rituximab. Um, whether this is because you're removing um, uh, a sort of controlling B-cell, T-cell interaction, I don't know. I really would have no idea. Or whether you're removing a population of B-cells that are actually providing a protective natural autoantibody or natural antibody response, which is sort of blocking any pathogenic antibodies. So I really don't know. Um, I think you know, the, the, the main thing is we really need to stratify patients. It's no sort of saying, oh, rituximab works and just giving it to everybody. We may be completely masking any positive benefit for patients who will benefit from rituximab if we select them properly, which is why I'm doing all this B-cell work, um, and then not give it to patients who would not benefit. It's just like in rheumatoid. If you give, if you give rituximab to seronegative patients, they're unlikely to respond very well. But seropositive patients, because we was based on a theory, which we developed over many years before giving it to the patients, and we said, right, we predict these will work. We'll just give it to seropositive, and it does work. Okay, so we really need to stratify with all the work that the other groups are doing, fantastic work to stratify. So... Actually, uh, one would hope that you get ill if you eliminate all B cells, because it's an important cell, isn't it? So one would think that you would get, uh, okay, the plasma cells will live a little while, but it's amazing that you can get rid of almost all B cells and then uh, walk up and stand as you do. They're fine. But no, you can also fine. take away the thymus. So you do thymectomy in others and, and doesn't harm them at all, so... It's, uh, it's a bit amazing, actually. Well, the B cells, though, I mean, they come back again, and also the plasma cells live for 17, 18, 19, 20 years, and the levels, I've looked at the levels of protective antibodies, and they don't change, but the autoantibodies do. So uh, no, but selective. you said that uh, the antibody goes to the bone marrow and stops new, uh, the novel production of B cells for a long time. So, new B so cells any new out. agent that comes in mind that you don't have antibodies against, that, that one you wouldn't be able to defend yourself against. They, you, get a, you do get a, you get a delayed response, but you do when the B cells, because there are still a few naive B cells floating around, you do get a response. Even if you give a, a flu vaccine, say three months after rituximab, you will get an antibody response, it's just delayed. Ah, so, so yep. all, all B cells were not eliminated then? Oh, okay, absolutely then. not, all no. Right. no. Taking the top Any off. other uh, fine questions? <laughs> now when we have the expertise around. Are there any more specific antibodies in production that uh, are generated against those critical cells or those markers that you are alluding to? Is that a uh, working process? Or? Um, well, the other, um, um, the other, well, there are many anti B cell agents now in development. Uh, just again, can you hear? Can you hear? Sorry, there. Okay. Um, there are things like uh, belimumab, which is against a, um, a cytokine that, that sort of uh, matures B cells. There's quite a few, not against those specific 
specific markers uh, that I was talking about, but um, there are many new anti B cell reagents coming on market now. So. <coughs> Market economy, yes, that's good. Uh, okay, then, if there are no more uh, uh, questions, then we take uh, a wonderful and uh, long cup of coffee time.